If you could go back and give that self of yours some advice, what would you say? I think I would have said, don't think you can do this on your own. Don't think that that's the goal. My guest today is Charles Elliott, Head of Software Engineering at the Seattle-based Institute for Disease Modeling, IDM. IDM researchers use computer modeling to shape global efforts to eradicate infectious diseases and to achieve permanent improvements in the health of those most in need. IDM is an institute within the Global Good Fund, a collaboration between Intellectual Ventures and Bill and Melinda Gates. A go-to domain expert on agile engineering practices, Charles has 30 years of hands-on development, solution design, management, and leadership experience in the software space. He joined Microsoft in 1993, where he worked on numerous impressive projects until his departure in 2017. During that time, Charles served in roles such as Head of Build Engineering for Microsoft Windows and Head of Engineering Services for Skype. And most challenging of all, he played a key role in Microsoft's careful embrace of open source software, leading to a major cultural shift at the world's largest software company. He recently served as VP of Product at Buddy, a startup IoT platform in the environmental monitoring space. Charles' experience in technology, engineering, and product are built on top of an impressive educational background spanning MIT, Oxford, and a Rhodes Scholarship. A talented speaker and presenter, he has presented to audiences as many as 15,000, and he's also a dedicated musician and theater director. Charles, welcome to the conversation. I was hoping to start with your career at Microsoft. You lived through the fabled cultural difficulties. Oh, yes. Siloed organizations mm -hmm. fighting for power, access and resources. Did you ever see any indications of that during your time there? And if so, what compelled you to stay? By all accounts, it was a very difficult time. I knew from observation as a young man that lots of people whose work and capabilities I admired had spent a long time in one place. Mm. That there was a time for moving around because you were trying to find your feet and there was a time for mastering your craft. Mm. And then there's a time for exploiting that mastery. So it didn't, um, it never occurred to me to just leave because I wasn't having fun one day. That's not, mm. it's not the way I'm built. Mm, that's interesting. But you know, to, to lean into, you know, you mentioned the cultural difficulties at Microsoft. Let's not downplay the, the fact that that actually happened, that there was a period of time when it felt like uh, this was a hard road. And um, I think at one point, uh, Bill Gates actually said that Microsoft, you know, sometime in the 90s, he said that Microsoft's biggest enemy was success, uh, that it had learned some things and was continually reapplying the same techniques while the world was changing rapidly underneath it. And, you know, in 1996, we did this big embrace of the internet, but we did this big embrace of the internet at the time when the internet was small, before there was e-commerce, you know, before, before there were, you know, a tenth of the things that we assume today. Other companies had embraced faster and with much bigger vision, mm. and they had a better time of it over the ensuing 15 years, while Microsoft, although we got it, um, yeah, we, we weren't moving very fast, and it was causing problems. Uh, of course, you have to be careful about quoting Bill Gates since you see him occasionally now. He has oversight into your work at IDM. Uh, yeah, he does. Um, oversight's possibly the wrong word. Uh -huh. um, I mean, the simple fact is he pays us. <laughs> but what he pays us for is to generate insights about infectious disease yeah. that he can then use to inform the kinds of decisions that Bill is in a place to, to make. Yeah. Um, so we are, we are not part of, for example, the, um, the foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, we are a completely separate org, but obviously we work incredibly closely with the foundation, with the World Health Organization, with all these other groups. 
Can you just summarize who the customer is for the engineers that you lead? Because it's an unusual customer. It is. And um, it's a fascinating challenge because uh, sometimes, sometimes as business people, we apply, prox we apply profit as being a proxy for knowing our customers. <laughs> uh, IDM does not have a profit motive. <laughs> Uh, and so we actually have to develop a fairly sophisticated understanding of who our customers are. Uh, what we deliver is insights. Mm -hmm. And those insights are, the first thing is they have to be trusted. <laughs> so one of our challenges is to understand what people who would use these insights need to see in them in order to say, well, that's a cool thing. Um, the software people at IDM have as their direct customer the researchers. Yeah, yeah, that's great. It's so cool. I was really fascinated when you first broke that down for me. The idea of researchers as the customer mm -hmm. is pretty unusual on the engineering landscape. It really is. You know, I've really found in our time working together, um, I've just found you to be a gold mine of thinking and experience when it comes to software development life uh, cycle, when it comes to leadership of teams, when it comes to thinking at scale. Uh, and the question I have for you is, um, do you think you went as high as you could have at Microsoft? Do you think there was room for you to have reached higher in terms of scope and impact? I, I kind of hoped that I would go higher, but I think there's, there's a lesson in there around um, the reality of cultural fit. Uh, um, I'm... I'm kind of laid back and measured uh, in, in the, if you ever do the, you know, the red, green, blue, yellow energy thing, I'm that impossible combination of blue analytical engine and yellow um, nurturing, uh, you know, I call myself, I call myself a high function introvert. Um, that's not the dominant social pattern at Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft is driven strongly by red energy by the what can we do today kind of energy um, and informed by analytical processes. But I'm basically not built that way. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my bosses used to say um, both proddingly and just, you know, statement of fact kind of thing that uh, I ran at a different clock speed. <laughs> You do march to the beat of your own drum. I do. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, you know, um, I'm old enough to say, yeah, that's how it is. And I did just fine. Uh, you were there for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. How did you know when it was time to leave? Um, it's a good question. I think for me, it was that I found myself too often on the sides of arguments where I was going, saying to myself, they're wrong, but there's nothing I can do to change this. That is a gem. Yeah, good. Yeah, so when you've, when you've stopped being able to be an agent for change, maybe, maybe the clocks, maybe you're moving into a different phase. And That's great. And I didn't want to be that. When we met, you mm -hmm. were on the job market. I was indeed. For the first time. In 30 or 40 decades. years. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this was after stepping away from your role as VP of product at Buddy. Uh, let's see, how old would you have been? This would have been? Well, I turned about... 62 in May. Yeah. So I was 61. Great. What was it like? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the job market is just crazy and terrifying anyway. Um, I think one of the first things you said to me was, we're going to have to inoculate against ageism. And I thought that was a very smart way of putting it because even places that aren't overtly ageist are seeking different things than what older people usually bring. Um, I've always said that mm. you, never, you can never fight a 21 year old on their own turf. And that's a kind of what it felt like for the first few months. It was utterly disorienting. Um, you know, feeling like, wow, this, what they're looking for is something that I long ago decided was not 
the kind of thing I had to offer. But the other thing was, that was more an artifact of having done, having gone so long without thinking about this, was I had no idea what I was pitching. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's where your work, yeah. our work together helped a lot. Yeah. Um, because, you know, being able to tell the story of 25 years in 20 seconds. <laughs> yes, that's it. That's it. Was uh, not something I had practiced and not something I'd even thought about. Yeah. Um, and so, so there was this period of initial disorientation and a feeling that, wow, you know, all these bad things that I've heard about uh, really are out Really there. are happening. Yeah. But then there was a more productive period of saying, but you know, the biggest problem here is that I don't know what I'm selling into this market. Absolutely. And I need to do a better job of that. Yeah, we had to productize you. As it were, as it were, those were, those, <laughs> there, there were some high energy conversations there. <laughs> With all that said, yes. what was it like to get the hiring call from IDM? I, it was amazing. Of course it was amazing. It was, you know, um, you know, it was one of those magic sort of progressions where you go from exploration to realizing that both sides want something to work out here. You know, it was clear from, they, they were starting to show more and more signs that, wow, this might work. And I was wanting it to work more and more. So the moment when it came together, we were all very happy. It Sounds was nice. like dating when you describe it that. Well, it is though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. In that, you know, it's, I mean, minus one or two things. Yeah, right. <laughs> now that you look back on the hiring process that you went through and the senior level job search, what advice would you have for others that are in the same situation as you look back on it? Um, well, I, I mean, listen to good advice. <laughs> and you, you gave great advice. I'm always, always, as you know, interested in um, clients and professionals sharing their backstory. <laughs> uh, I'm interested in defining influences from childhood because for me, uh, it really sheds so much light on who I'm dealing with now and sort of where the blind spots are, where the strengths are, sort of what we're seeing in real time does have an origin yeah. point. Yeah. I know in your case, your father was a very important influence. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And he yeah. was the... He was a university professor uh, and president, ultimately president of a university. Yeah. And my mother was also a university professor. Yes, amazing. Who, who moved on into different realms. Very academic yeah. family. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, you, MIT, Oxford. Uh, what, so my question for you uh -huh. is, what were you supposed to be? <laughs> well, you know, as a kid, I was, a, I was a, the classic sophomore. I was a wise fool. Uh, I assumed I would be like my parents. And that assumption um, went unquestioned right up to the moment that it was clear that I was a lousy lab researcher. And you know, you don't get a PhD in biochemistry if you suck at lab work, and I did. Uh, and so I could have done with a lot of good advice at that time. Mm. And uh, and didn't get it, which is, you know, something of a regret, but it also has, has helped me to understand that, yeah, I'm an academic. I, I am, you know, that kind, of, that kind of brain box approach to looking at problems. Okay, that is me. Uh, but also, I want to help people. You know. Let me ask you a question. You said I could have done with more advice. Yeah. I could have done with more advice. So... If you could go back and give that self of yours some advice, yeah. throw him a bone, what would you say? I think I would have said, don't think you can do this on your own. Don't think that that's the goal. You know, the, the image of the solitary genius, which had motivated me for so long, um, is both very, very rare and pathological. Most people trying to be a solitary genius will end up in a bad place. And so I could very much have used someone who could reach past all the messages that I was sending out that said, leave me alone, and say, you're not going to help yourself that way. Hmm. Do you feel like you found that when you left? Left? Uh, oh, you mean academia? Yes. 
No, no, actually, it took another 30 years <laughs> to get that one sorted out. Okay, got it. So it was not an, it was not an instantaneous lesson. Oh, no, 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 no. It was, it was, it was more like, so one of the pieces of advice I give to people is that, you know, if the same thing goes wrong for you four or five times in a row, the next conversation should be with the mirror. Mm -hmm. um, and that happened to me over the course of a career. I did lots of cool stuff and frequently felt, huh, that didn't quite work out, but it took a long time to connect those particular dots. In part because, you know, I was having a good time and I was getting some good work done. In closing, I wanted to talk to you about success. Mm. Can you tell that your career has been a success? Um, I'm data driven, so yes. I'm also emotional, so no. Uh, what gets in the way? The, um, my friend, uh, my friend Koji uh, says that, um, you're going to have to edit this bit. My friend Koji says that inside every 60 year old, there's a 13 year old wondering what the fuck happened. That's the part. That's yeah. the part that gets in the way. Yeah. Um, what the, does that mean for you? What it means for me is in, in practical terms is that I put a huge focus on listening because my own inner voice is not going to necessarily tell me, tell me the truth that matters, especially in the role I play. You know, because the people who work for me don't want to be, you know, don't, don't want to be led by a 13 year old. So Fair. I, try to be, I try to be sensitive to that dynamic. In fact, it's more than just try to be sensitive to that, that dynamic. I mean, my, my whole approach to management and leadership is based on listening and recognizing you know, that everyone has these kinds, of, these kinds of strange dynamics going on inside themselves. So true. Yeah, it's amazing having so many leaders sit on the couch in my office and seeing it over and over again. I bet. Um, but it's also fascinating to me to talk to folks who have, um, you know, just widely acknowledged successful careers um, and kind of look under the hood and, <laughs> and <laughs> see the places where that doesn't rest so clearly for the individual. Yeah, I mean, you know, and some of it, again, it's that 13-year-old or 18-year-old or 25-year-old, you know. Um, of course I measure myself against my dad. It's a completely irrelevant metric, but you can't get away from it. <laughs> Head of a university in a different time and place, yeah, other country. Yeah. exactly. Um, well, Charles, I want to thank you so much for spending this time with me today. It has been my privilege to oh. chat with you and look at some of what you've achieved in your life. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. My pleasure. All right. Thanks. <laughs>